Hello again, I'm Kevin, this is my wife Brittany, and we're going to read another uh, few pages out of the uh, daily Bible here. Okay, so yes, yeah, so today we're going to be doing June 9th, and we're going to be starting in 2 Kings, chapters 5, verse 1, all the way through chapter 6, verse 33. Now, Naaman, captain of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man with his master and highly respected. Because by him the Lord had given victory to Aaron. The man was also a valiant warrior, but he was a leper. Now the Arameans had gone out in the bands and had taken captive a little girl from the land of Israel, and she waited on Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, I wish that my master were here with the prophet who was in Samaria. Then he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus, and thus spoke the girl who was from the land of Israel. Then the king of Aram said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. He departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand shekels of gold and ten changes of clothes. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, And now as this letter comes to you, behold, I have sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man is sending word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? But consider now and see how he is seeking a quarrel against me. It happened when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent word to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Now let him come to me, and he shall know there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariots and stood at the doorway of the house of Elisha. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh will be restored to you, and you will be clean. But Naaman was furious and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Parfar the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel. Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. Then his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father had the prophet told you to do some great thing. Would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. When he returned to the man of God with all his company and came and stood before him, he said, Behold now, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. So please take a present from your servant now. But he said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will take nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. Naaman said, If not, please let your servant at least be given two mules. A load of earth for your servant will no longer burnt offering, nor will he sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. And we have our first note of the day, which is from chapter 5, verse 17, which is two mules load of earth. In the ancient Near East, it was thought that a god could be worshipped only on the soil of a nation to which he was bound. Therefore, Naaman made Naaman wanted a load of Israelite soil on which to make burnt offerings and sacrifices to the Lord when he returned to Damascus. This request confirmed how Naaman had changed. Whereas he had previously disparaged Israel's river, now he wanted to take a pile of Israel's soil to Damascus. Now we're going back into verse 18. In this matter, may the Lord pardon your servant. When my master goes into the house of Rimen to worship there, and he leans on my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Rimen. When I bow myself in the house of Rimen, the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. He said, Go in peace. So he departed from him some distance. The Isai servant of Elisha, the man of God, thought, Behold, my master has spared this Naaman, the Aramean, by not receiving from his hand what he brought. As the Lord lives, I will run after him and take something from him. So Gizai pursued Naaman. When Naaman saw one running after him, he came down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? 
He said, All is well. My master has sent me, saying, Behold, just now two young men of the sons of the prophets have come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of clothes. Naman said, Be pleased to take two talents. And he urged them and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of clothes and gave them two of his servants, and they carried them before him. When he came to the hill, he took them from their hand and deposited them into the house. And he sent the men away, and they departed. But he went in and stood before his master, and Elisha said to him, Where have you been, Gizai? And he said, Your servant went nowhere. Then he said to him, Did not my heart go with you? When the man turned from his chariot to meet you, is it a time to receive money and to receive clothes and olive groves and vineyards and sheep and oxen and male and female servants? Therefore the leprosy of Naman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. So we went out from his presence a leper as white as snow. Now our next note is from chapter 5 verse 27. Leprosy shall cling to you. Gezai's greed had cast a shadow over the integrity of Elisha's prophetic office. This made him no better than the people thinking that Israel's pro false prophets were prophesied for material gain, the very thing he wanted to avoid, as stated in verses 15 through 16. Gezai's act of betrayal and lack of faith in the Lord's ability to provide. As a result, Elisha condemned Gezai and his descendants to suffer Naman's uh, skin disease forever. The punishment was a twist for Gezai, who had gone to quote unquote take something from Naman, but what he received was Naman's disease. And now we're just doing chapter 6. Now the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, Behold now, the place before you where we are living is too limited for us. Please let us go to the Jordan, and each of us take from there a beam, and let us make a place there for ourselves where we may live. So he said, Go. Then one said, Please be willing to go with your servants. And he answered, I shall go. So he went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was filling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried out and said, Alas, my master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where did it fall? And when he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it in there and made the iron float. He said, Take it. <clears throat> Our note is from chapter 6, verse 5, Axe Head Borrowed. Iron was expensive and relatively rare in Israel at that time, and the student prophet was very poor. The axe head was loaned to the prophet since he could not have afforded it on his own and would have no means to reimburse the owner for it. So now we're picking back up into this verse, uh, verse 7. So he said, take it up for yourself so he put out his hand and took it now the king of Aram was warring against Israel he counseled with his servants saying in such and such a place shall be my camp the men of God sent word to the king of Israel saying beware that you do not pass this place for Arameans are coming down there the king of Israel sent to the place about where the man of God had told him thus he warned him so that he guarded himself there more than once or twice now the heart of the king of Aram was enraged over this thing. He called his servants and said to him, Will you tell me which of us is for the king of Israel? One of his servants said, No, my lord, O king. But Elisha the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel, The words that you speak in your bedroom. So he said, Go and see where he is, that I may send and take him. And it was told to him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. He sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. Now when the attendant of the man of God had risen early and gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city. As the servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he saw, Behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. When, the, when they came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, 
Strike this people with blindness, I pray. So he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Then Elisha said to them, This is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. And he brought them to Samaria. When they had come to Samaria, Elisha said, O oh Lord, open the eyes of these men, that they may see. So the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw. And behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. When the king of Israel when he saw them, he said to Elisha, My father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? He answered, You shall not kill them. Would you kill those you have taken captive with your sword and with your bow? Set bread and water before them, and they may eat and drink and go to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them, and when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away, and they went to their master. And the marauding bands of Arameans did not come again in the land of Israel. Now it came about after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, gathered all his army and went up and besieged Samaria. There was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for eighty shekels of silver and a fourth of a cab of a dove's dung for five shekels of silver. As the king of Israel was passing by a wall, a woman cried out to him, saying, Help, my lord, O king. He said, If the Lord does not help you, from where shall I help you? From the threshing floor or from the wine press? And the king said to her, What is the matter with you? She answered, This woman said to me, Give your son what we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him. And I said to her the next day, Give your son that we may eat him, and she has hidden her son. When the king heard the words of the woman, he tore his clothes. Now he was passing by on the wall, and other people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth beneath his body. Then he said, May God do so to me, and more also, if the head of Elisha, son of, of Shaphat, remains on him today. Now Elisha was sitting in his house, and the elders were sitting with him. And the king sent a man from his presence, but before the messenger came, he said to the elders, do you see how this son of a murderer has sent to take away my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold the door shut against him. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? Why he was still talking with them, behold, the messenger came down from him and said, Behold, this evil is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Now we're going to be moving into... Psalm of 72, verses 1 through 7. It's called the Psalm of Solomon. Give the king your judgments, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your afflicted with justice. Let the mountains bring peace to the people and the hills in righteousness. May he vindicate the afflicted of the people, save the children of the needy, and crush the oppressor. Let them fear you while the sun endures and as long as the moon throughout all generations. May he come down like rain upon the mown grass, like showers that the water earth. In his days may the righteous flourish in abundance of peace till the moon is no more. And then now we're going to go into Proverbs chapter 18 verses 10 through 11. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and is safe. A rich man's wealth is his strong city, and like a high wall on his own imagination. Now we're going to be reading from the New Testament in the Gospel of John, chapter 18, verses 1 through 18. The name of the Lord is this, I'm sorry, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the ravine of the kingdom where he was a garden now in which he entered with his disciples. Now Judas also, who was betraying him, knew the place where Jesus had often met there with his disciples. Judas then, having received a Roman cohort and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with the lanterns and torches and weapons. So Jesus, knowing all things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am he. And Judas, who was also who was betraying him, was standing with them. So when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Therefore he again asked them, 
whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so if you seek me, let these go their way. Now we have a note from chapter 18, verses 4 through 8. Whom do you seek? By twice asking that question in verses 4 and 7, to which they replied, Jesus the Nazarene, in verses 5 and 7, Jesus was forcing them to acknowledge that they had no authority to take his disciples. In fact, he demanded that they let the disciples go in verse 8. The force of his demand was established by the power in his words when he spoke, I am he, in verse 6. A designation he had used before to declare himself God. This was in chapter 8, 28, in 58, in chapter 6, 35, chapter 8, 12, chapter 10, 7, chapters 9, 11, 14, chapters 11, verse 25, 14, verse 6, and chapters 15, verses 1 and 5. They were jolted backward and on the ground, as stated in verse 6, and this power to display an authoritative demand not to take the disciples were of immense significance, as the next verse indicates. So now we're picking back up in verse 9. To fulfill the word which he spoke, of those whom you have given me, I lost not one. Simon Peter, then having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear, and the slave's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put the sword in the sheath, the cup which the Father has given me. Shall I not drink it? So the Roman cohort and the commander and officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And he led him to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Now Caiaphas was the next one who had advised the Jews that it was expedient for one man to die on behalf of the people. Simon Peter was following Jesus, and so was another disciple. Now that the disciple was known for the high priest and entered with Jesus into the, cohort, into the court of the high priest, but Peter was standing at the door outside. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. Then the slave girl who kept the door said to Peter, You are not also one of the man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the officers were standing there, having made a charcoal fire, for it was a cold, and they were warning themselves. And Peter was also with them, standing and warming himself. Now I have a note from uh, chapter 18, verse 13. Annas first. Annas held the high priesthood office from A.D. 6 through 15, when Valerius Gratus Pilate's predecessor removed him from office, in spite of this, Annas continued to wield influence over the office, most likely because he was still regarded as the true high priest, and also because no fewer than five of his sons and son-in-law, Caiaphas, uh, Caiaphas held the office at one time or another. Two trials occurred, one Jewish and one Roman. The Jewish phase began with the informal examination by Annas, as stated in verses 12 through 14 and in 19 through 23 probably giving time for the members of the Sandrinan to hurriedly gather together. A session before the Sandrinan was next. This is stated in Matthew chapter 26, verses 57 through 68, at which consensus was reached to send Jesus to Pilate in Matthew 27, verses 1 through 2. The Roman phase began with a first examination before Pilate, stated in verses 28 through 38, and also in Matthew chapter 27, 11 through 14. And then Herod Antipas, quote unquote, that fox, as stated in Luke chapter 13, 32. They interrogated him as stated in Luke 23, verses 6 through 12. Lastly, Jesus appeared again before Pilate in verses 38 through 19, and also in Matthew chapter 27, 15 through 31. Now we have our note of the day, which is for day nine. Who was Naaman and what does he teach us about obedience to God? In 2 Kings chapter 5, 1, four phases describe the importance of Naaman. One, he was the supreme commander of the army of Syria, as indicated by the term captain, used of an army's highest ranking officer. This is stated in Genesis 21, 22 um, and 1 Chronicles 27, 34. He was a great man, a man of high social standing and prominence. 
He was an honorable man in the eyes of his master, a man highly regarded by the king of Syria because of the military victories he had won. And four, he was a mighty man of valor, a term used in the Old Testament for both a man of great wealth, as stated in Ruth 2 verse 1, and courageous warrior, as also stated in Judges chapter 6, 12, and 11, 1. Severely mitigating against all was the fact that he suffered from leprosy, a serious skin disease, as stated in verse 27. Naaman's military success was attributable to the God of Israel, who is sovereign over all nations, as stated in Isaiah chapter 10, verse 13, and Amos uh, chapter 9, 7. Because of his personal greatness in verse 1, his huge gift of 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, which are about 750 pounds of silver and 150 pounds of gold in verse 5. In diplomatic letter in verse 6, Naaman expected that Elisha would surely come out to him. Verse 11, he expected personal attention to his need. However, Elisha did not even go out and meet him. Instead, he sent his instructions for healing through a messenger in verse 10. Naaman was angry because he anticipated a personal cleansing ceremony from the prophet himself. Besides, if Naaman needed to wash in a river, two Syrian rivers were superior to the muddy Jordan. However, it was obedience to God's word that was the issue, not the quality of the water. Fortunately, Naaman had a servant who pointed out to him that he had been willing to do anything, no matter how hard to be cured. He should be even more willing, therefore, to do something as easy as washing in a muddy river. Naaman's healing restored his flesh to that of a little child, as stated in verse 14. Upon his healing, Naaman returned from the Jordan River to Elisha's house in Samaria to give confession of his new belief. There is no God but in Israel, as stated in verse 15. And that's the end of our reading for today. We thank you for um, stay, staying with us. And um, we have a link at the bottom of our page. Uh, to take you to uh, Grace to You, Pastor John MacArthur's um, church, to purchase. You can get some of these. He's got all sorts. He's got decades of books, decades of recordings, decades of YouTube videos, and he's absolutely wonderful and very powerful to listen to. So uh, hopefully uh, this will help get you there. So again, thank you.